thank you for letting an ancient historian and classicist crash the archaeologist party. Um, this is part of the very early stages uh, of a project I'm working on, on ghost stories and belief. And my method is basically to compare ancient ghost stories told in ancient texts or in other media with modern ghost folklore. Uh, I've produced one article on this so far in my edited collection, Imagining the Afterlife in the Ancient World, where I compare the Perseus 4.7 with uh, modern online folklore. But today, I'm looking at ghosts of place in its most literal sense, as in uh, stories about ghosts that haunt particular places. And I'm looking at the stories told by Pausanias and comparing them with modern narratives that share some similarities, looking to see if the in fact, we have much more data about the modern stories. We have much rounder understanding of the modern stories and their contexts. See if that can shed some light on what Pausanias is talking about and possibly vice versa. So the main questions throughout this are, why do we tell ghost stories? Why do we tell ghost stories connected to particular places? And did the Greeks and Romans, as represented by Pausanias, tell ghost stories connected to particular places for the same reasons that we do? So there are three basic types of ghost story. There's literary ghost stories, which are works of fiction with an author, an identifiable author. There's fabulate. These are the types of stories you tell around the campfire. So I heard that this happened. This place is haunted. They say that. Stories about vanishing hitchhikers and haunted houses. And then the other type is memorate. These are personal accounts. I saw a ghost. I went to this place and felt something, saw something, heard something, experienced something. Something told secondhand could maybe be considered a memorate uh, if it was from a very close friend or family member. Generally, they're first hand. I'm considering adding a fourth category for historical stories for the ancient material, but that's something I'm going to have to think about later in the project. So Pausanias' description of Greece, for anyone unfamiliar, is what it says on the tin. It is a description of Greece. He describes the landscape, he describes uh, shrines, altars, temples. He's very interested in religious architecture and in the remnants of the past. Pausanias is writing in the second century AD. So the Greek past that he's writing about, he's already looking 500, 700 years into the past, to the glory days of ancient Greece for the most part. There is no exact modern equivalent to this text. Modern travel guides are more practical. They don't include the same amount of folklore and history as Pausanias does. Travel literature doesn't tend to include much in the way of folklore or much specific uh, description of location. And then probably the closest is collections of myths, folk tales, ghost stories, local history associated with particular places. Now, the modern examples of these are rather more focused on their particular subject, so ghosts or myths or whatever, uh, than Pausanias is, but they're really the, the closest. There isn't quite uh, an exact modern equivalent to his text. So the sources I've used for the modern folklore for today, I've looked at those books. I own many of them. <laughs> you know the ones I mean. Ghost Stories from Scotland, Ghost Stories from Southeast Michigan, that's one of them. Uh, Haunted Battlefields of Alabama, which I read cover to cover in preparation. <laughs> Um, I've looked at tourist websites, both general tourist websites and those focusing on ghost tourism. And then for memorates, I've looked at the website ghostsofamerica.com, which collects memorates and organises them by place. So you can search the website by uh, town in America. I make a lot of vague references to modern Western culture. I'm basically looking at the US and the UK. Um, this is for a combination of practical reasons that uh, English is my first language, uh, but also the culture of the US, particularly in the Deep South, has quite a few similarities with Greece and Rome. There's a history of slavery, there's a lot of witchcraft uh, still practiced in the Deep South. Voodoo is still very much a thing in the Deep South of the United States. So there are some connections with the ancient world that make the comparison that little bit. Okay, so these are the six ghost stories told by Pausanias. I was going to talk about all six, but that paper was 33 minutes long. So instead, we're going to look at three of them, um, the top three. He tells a story about the battlefield at Marathon. He says that when you go there, you can hear the sounds of the battle, horses neighing and men fighting. 
He tells a story that actually takes place in Italy, but he saw the statue uh, referenced in the story when he was at Olympia, because it had been moved to Olympia, about one of Odysseus's men who rapes a young girl. He is then stoned to death, and he haunts uh, the locality, Temesa. He kills the villagers until the ghost is propitiated, and then eventually another hero comes along and fights and defeats the ghost. Pausanias sadly does not explain how you fight a ghost. I would really like to know. I think uh, iron bullets or something. <laughs> um, and then the third one I'm going to look at is a story of a haunted racetrack at Olympia, where at a certain point in the racetrack, the horses uh, pulling the chariots will uh, suddenly uh, rear up uh, and become very distressed. So those are the three we're looking at. Uh, and you can see there the locations. Um, got obviously Temesa in Italy, uh, Olympia in the Peloponnese, uh, and Marathon uh, a little bit further north in Greece. So haunted battlefields, this is one of the most common types of ghost story, and the type of auditory, haunt, auditory? Oral? <laughs> haunting that Pausanias describes is really common. There are so many stories about people visiting battlefields and hearing the sounds of battle. You get visual ghost stories about them as well. Um, you get a bit of both, but loads and loads of stories about people hearing battle. And you can see uh, from that slide just a few examples of uh, modern folklore. And you might notice that one name appears on every single one of those lists, which is Gettysburg uh, in the US. There are so many ghost stories about Gettysburg. And it features on all of these lists of most haunted battlefields. But if you go to the official tourist website for Gettysburg from the US National Park Service, there is nothing about any of this. So this is a site which has a huge amount of folklore relating to ghosts and haunting attached to it, but the official site does not want to acknowledge it in any way. It is a military site. It is a site where people want to focus on kind of serious contemplation, history. It's a national park, so they want to focus on preserving the environment, but they're not interested in encouraging ghost tourism. They must know it's happening, but they don't want to encourage it. And the same is true of all the other haunted battlefields I looked at. Uh, this is Glencoe. My mum told me Glencoe was haunted, so I can tell you that is a current oral tradition. Um, Glencoe is too busy selling itself as an island, uh, a highland sorry, paradise to want to talk about ghosts. Culloden has nothing about ghosts or haunting, even though it's frequently featured on those lists. Edge Hill, which turns up on several of those lists, uh, UK Battlefields Resource Centre, very interested in history, military history, but nothing about ghosts or haunting. <coughs> you can find information on things like this. So this is um, a blog relating to Scottish tourism, but not an official kind of site, uh, website for the site. And this does list both Glencoe and Culloden. So if you go looking for ghost tourism, you can find information very easily. But if you go looking for the official site for the battlefield, there's nothing. But there are loads and loads of memorants available. So this is from ghostofamerica.com. And as you can see, there are 28 pages of Gettysburg memorants. There are absolutely loads of them. And that is the most results from any of the searches I did in preparation for this paper, which there were several that I don't have time to talk about. This is by far the biggest number of results that I got. Uh, I haven't got time to go into it. This one's fairly typical. Um, it includes the teller saying, oh, I didn't believe my boyfriend was with me. He was really skeptical. We didn't believe any of it. And then we had this experience and it convinced us. That's a really common factor in memorance. And there's also loads of photos. Apparently, there are soldiers standing by the road. I have got the bigger, bigger size picture. There it is. I can't see them. <laughs> that looks like a field. Um, but if anybody can see any soldiers, let me know and point them out. Uh, to be fair, I didn't see most of the hidden ghosts in Hill House either. Oh dear, I need to hurry up. So, this is very, 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 very common. What I think is happening is that you go to a battlefield, you see an empty field, and it just looks like a field. And you want to experience the battle. You know that you've come to commemorate a battle, but all you see is possibly a rather nice day, some nice countryside. And it seems to produce the idea that the ghosts might be here, that all of this violence and suffering must have left its mark on the landscape in some way. And that seems true of the ancient world 
as well as the modern. And Pausanias notes that it's no good going looking for the ghosts. That won't do well for you. The official sites in the modern examples don't want you to come looking for them. You have to spontaneously experience it, almost as a reaction to the site. I'm going to have to hurry up because I'm running out of time. So, number two, haunted racetracks. There aren't very many of these. Um, the only horse racing track I could find that was haunted was, uh, it was the bar that was haunted, not the racetrack. There are two motor racing tracks that are haunted. Uh, Brooklyn's the most haunted racetrack in Britain, or the only haunted racetrack in Britain, as far as I can tell, and Talladega in the States, but there are no memorates relating to the racetrack from Talladega. There are other stories, but nothing to do with the racetrack. I found one memorate relating to Brooklyn's. So these are not being talked about. Not like the haunted battlefields. This is a much smaller uh, subsection of ghost stories. Sorry, I'm moving on really quickly. Um, and if you look at the Pausanias story, it's not humans that are reacting to the ghosts in his story, it's the horses. For whatever reason, the horses get upset at this particular part of the track. And the assumption is that they've been frightened by ghosts. But humans aren't experiencing ghosts at the racetrack. And you go to a racetrack for very different reasons than a battlefield. There's Probably a lot of death, especially motor racing in the modern world and chariot racing in the ancient world. A lot of people have been killed doing this, but that's not why you go there. You go to a racetrack not wanting anybody to die, and so people aren't thinking about it, and they're not as interested in sharing stories. Brooklyn's is the exception, but there it's a 1920s, 30s era racing driver who is haunting a part of the track that is no longer used. So different reason for visiting the site, lack of ghost stories. And my final quick example, ghosts that are violent. There are not very many modern ghost stories that are memorates where ghosts kill people. Um, there are ghosts who are violent in life. One example is Delphine LaLaurie from New Orleans, a woman who tortured slaves. Uh, you can hear the moaning of the slaves. Uh, in the 19th century, her house was used as a school for young black girls, and they claimed they had been scratched and bruised by that woman. There was a murder in 1894 that was attributed to her ghost. But a medium who visited more recently said the violent spirits had moved on. So you can visit it without actually fearing for your life. Because actually being killed by a ghost in modern ghost literature is very rare, much more so than in the ancient ghost literature. Uh, this is a memorate from New Orleans talking about how voodoo is still practiced there. Um, ghost encounters that resulted in death are actually few and far between. Nearly all of the examples from this website take place 1963 or earlier, which is when Alcatraz was closed. They're all in the past. There is one example that wasn't featured on this website of a woman called Elisa Lamb, who some people think was killed by a ghost in Los Angeles in 2013. And there's a couple from Thailand and Sweden, but very, very few people killed by ghosts in modern ghost folklore. Uh, this is from Adams, Tennessee, where the Bell Witch supposedly lived. Only two memorates from Adams, Tennessee. But the tourist websites love it. These violent ghosts who have supposedly killed people but a hundred years ago. Now, these will be sold by the tourist websites. So tourism in Tennessee has lists of haunted places. This is the Bell Witch who supposedly poisoned a man. And there's the whole story of the Bell Witch and what happened there. New Orleans has 30 haunted tours listed on its official websites. Ghost tours are huge in New Orleans. And its associations with voodoo and vampires and all sorts of things uh, play into that as well. Ah, move on. There we go. Um, so there's the Pausanias story. And this is an interesting contrast between the ancient and modern material. In the modern material, ghosts only really kill people in the past, which means you can have a safe experience. Like the battlefield, you're going to a place where death and violence has happened. And that's why you're going there. But unlike the battlefield, you're not expecting to kind of necessarily hear it yourself. It's almost voyeuristic. You might want an echo of that violence. And here, the tourist websites will pick it up and run with it because the violence is so safely in the past and because they are not sites of kind of official military patriotic commemoration, the tourist board will absolutely run with it. And you get that lurid attraction of true crime stories. In the Pausanias story, you have to propitiate the ghost. And there aren't as many options for propitiating the ghost in the modern world. There are some, but not as many. So in the ancient world, the ghosts are more deadly because you can propitiate them. You can turn to the gods or you can worship the ghost, sacrifice to the ghost itself and alleviate the danger that way. 
In the modern case, there's less option for that, so you have to shift the violence into the past so you can experience it like a roller coaster without actually endangering yourself. Okay, I need to sum up really super quickly because I think I'm out of time. So um, there are two reasons to tell a ghost story. Time's up. Okay, um, scaring people in entertainment. Uh, but just to add that there's something slightly more complex going on in particular places. It is about processing the memory of the events that happened there, but it's a very particular type of entertainment as well that's provided by ghost stories. You have to be going to a very particular type of place to want that type of entertainment. And exactly what entertainment you're looking for varies depending on the type of location you're heading for. I'll just leave that slide up there, so thank you very much. <laughs>